When I was towards the end of elementary school, when I was a young boy, uh, it was my mission in life to find something that would make me cool and make me stand out, because around about the time of elementary school is when people start paying a little bit more attention to each other, looking for what makes you stand out. Uh, And I wanted something that would make me stand out in a good way. I had some things that made me stand out in a bad way. Uh, I was growing into my very, very British teeth. Uh, If you don't get that joke, I would urge you to go look at pictures of people who are British and their teeth, but it would traumatize you. So uh, don't do that. Uh, But I needed a lot of things that would make me a little bit more likable. Uh, And what I got into my head is what would make me more likable, what would make me interesting as a person was learning a musical instrument. Now, usually kids uh, will pick something a little rock and roll, a guitar, some drums, but I thought I wanted something a little bit more elegant, something a little bit more classy. I wanted to play the trumpet. I wanted to be like this guy right here. I wanted to be the best trumpet player around so that people would want to be like me and would think, wow, that's an interesting guy. He's got some talent. So I applied for a local youth orchestra in the area, and what would happen is that you would go in, they would test you, Uh, They would test you for things like rhythm and different things, see what your kind of base musical ability was, and then they would assign you an instrument based on kind of where you were. They didn't assign me a trumpet. They assigned me the French horn. This is not good for a kid entering middle school. It's big, it's clunky, it's French. (laughs) I don't need that in my life, but they told me that if I worked hard, I played it well and I did kind of grew in my skill level, that it was possible that I could move to another instrument if they thought I fit that better. So I stuck it out and I said, you know, I need this really badly, so I'm gonna do this. I learned that French horn and they did move me to the tuba. (laughs) A bigger, clunkier instrument. Now for those of you who are uh, brass lovers and music lovers, you probably think that I'm a very uncultured individual right now. I now realize as an adult how beautiful these instruments are. So don't turn against me quite yet. I love these now. And actually looking back as a kid, because I gave up very quickly after that tuber, I kind of called it quits. And I wish I hadn't. Because what a beautiful instrument. What a unique instrument. How many people do you know that get the opportunity to play this? I was getting to play it for free. The orchestra would allow you to play it as long as you played in the concerts and different things like that. It was kind of a a local government-sponsored thing. So I was getting to play these for free. But I didn't appreciate at all what they could do, how unique an opportunity it was to be playing these. You see, instruments and music was something I used in my life to get goals that I had for myself. It wasn't a goal in and of itself. I wasn't doing it because I loved music or I appreciated music or I wanted to better know music. And the truth is, a lot of times, this is how we approach God. The same way that I approached music, God is a means to get to our ends. He's something that we go to, someone we go to to get other goals in our life. He's not of first priority. And the discipline that we're looking at today is really the question of what's going to have priority in our life. What are we going to choose as first in our life? We're talking about the discipline of seeking. And as we've talked about each week, these disciplines are things that we engage in, things that we train ourselves in so that we can better love God and know God and better love others around us. And seeking is no different. We seek God so that we can better know him, And so that we can see that he in himself is the end of everything that we need and could want. So that we can better love others. The questions that we are going to ask ourselves this morning is, what is of first importance to us? Is God a priority? Is he the priority? Or is he something that's in there with the rest of everything else? I want to dive straight in and look at a talk that Jesus gave, his most famous, famous talk, in fact, the Sermon on the Mount, and look at Matthew 6 together. And we're gonna look at what to seek, who to seek, and how to seek. This is what Jesus tells those people that listened. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the beds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than them? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? 
And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The first thing that we need to talk about this morning is what to seek. Have you ever noticed these days, uh, if you spend any length of time on the internet, there are many websites that seem to be able to read your mind. That if you're on the internet, these ads will pop up and they'll know exactly what it is that you want. This happened to me this summer. Uh, As I was on the internet doing various things, uh, we were uh, expecting our brand new baby. And so we were buying a lot of things for the baby coming. And we would go on websites and little things would pop up. Uh, Now, if you know a lot about me, you also know that I love superheroes. I'm a bit of a superhero fanatic, so I spend too much time reading things about superheroes. And all of that came together to create one thing for me that would show up on almost every single website I visited. This is a picture right here. This t-shirt, Farthor, like dad, just way mightier. And it's big business these days that websites will collect these things you do, the data points about you, and they figure out what matters most to you. And this was the end of result for, of that for me. This would pop up everywhere. See, they knew that I was gonna be a dad this summer. They knew that I, looked, I liked superheroes. And if you look at the bottom, it says handsome and exceptional. How did they know that? <laughs> See, the truth is, is our lives are a lot like how the internet works these days. There are data points, there are things that we spend our time on and our energy on, there are things that we go to that tell the world what's most important to us. If we were to take all the things that we do in our life today, if we were to put them up on the screen, if we were to analyze them and sift through them, what would the things that you do say about what's most important to you? What would what you spend your money on say about what's most important to you? What would your thought life say about what's most important to you? Jesus in this sermon starts by saying, do not be anxious about your life. What will you eat or what will you drink? Nor about your body, what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? And then he jumps at the end and says, but seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus in this sermon is setting up a contrast of things that are valuable to us. And he states some of the things that are valuable to all of us at the outset. He says, we worry about food, we worry about clothing, we worry about drink. Jesus could have gone on and included many things in that list, couldn't he? We worry about money, we worry about security, we worry about comfort, we worry about legacy. These are the things that we care about and what Jesus says is don't be anxious about those things. Don't let those things be the priority in your life, but seek first the kingdom of God. Let God's kingdom be of first importance. This is Jesus' point. Everybody is seeking something. Everybody is seeking something, but only one thing can give us what we truly need. The question is, what will satisfy those needs best? What will truly meet the longing of your soul? Now what Jesus isn't saying is he isn't saying that to care about these things, to have value for these things is bad or sinful or something that we shouldn't be doing. It's unavoidable that we will care about things like security and comfort. What Jesus is simply saying is don't let those things master you. Don't become a slave to those things by becoming anxious about them, fearful about them. Make sure that the end goal of all that you do is always God's kingdom and he will take care of you. As he takes care of the lilies of the field, as he takes care of the beds of the air. And what Jesus says, one of the most wonderful things that Jesus says is, are we not of more value than them? 
If God so graciously provides for the needs of all of creation, how much more us who are imprinted with his image, who he calls his treasured possession, who he sends his son to search for and die for, should he not be the priority if that's who he is, if that's what he does? C.S. Lewis once said, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. C.S. Lewis is taking a bit of a different spin on Jesus' words here and saying the same thing, that if our goal is the things of this world, then that's where it will end. But if our goal is God and his kingdom, then not only will we have our needs met, but we will find the one behind all those needs, the one who is the beginning of all things and the end of all things and the one who can satisfy the longing of our souls and our hearts in the way nothing else can. And that's what we really need. You remember the story of the woman at the well and how she would come to the well every day, this is in John 4, and she would take water to go back to drink. And what Jesus said to that woman is he he used the opportunity to say, you come here every day and you get water every day and you go back but it runs dry, you get thirsty again, you've got to come back. But I can give you water that will never run dry. Jesus is the one that we really need. All the other needs that we have are kind of echoes of our need that we have in him. That's why he should be our priority. And the hard truth is, is many of us can feel that we are seeking God when in truth, we are seeking something else and just using God to get to that thing. I do it all the time. I can even do it in this pulpit. I can get up here and I can talk about Jesus and I can preach about Jesus But the truth is in my heart, I'm doing this to get to something else. Maybe it's so that you will think that I am successful. Maybe it is so that you will think that I am put together. But that shouldn't matter to me. What should matter to me is Jesus. He is my goal. He is the one that I want lifted up. He is the one that I want people to look at, to see, and to dwell on. Because he's better than I am. I need to use the things in my life not as something in and of themselves that I need to have, but as ways that I can look back to, seek and serve God's kingdom. What is it for you? What are you tempted to put before God's kingdom? What are you tempted to dwell on more often, spend more money on, give more time to? Is it family? Is it work? Is it politics? Is it finances? All of those things are good, important, when they're in the right order, when they come after the kingdom of God. That's why we need to see who to seek, who to seek. Have you ever gone to your annual physical with the doctor? You sit down and he kind of lays out for you the best advice for the next year. Maybe he says something like, let's lay off the dairy this year. Let's get some more exercise in. And we say, yes, doctor, great advice. Leave the office and go straight to Dairy Queen. I'm terrible at this. He always tells me things every year that I need to be doing better, that I need to be paying attention to, to stay healthy, to be in good shape. And the truth is, I agree up here, but I never put them into practice. And most of us would never sit in the doctor's office and admit to that, right? Nobody would, when the doctor says, lay off dairy, say, no doctor, dairy makes my dreams come true. (laughs) We don't want to admit to that. And we sometimes we don't want to admit to those places in our life where we may agree intellectually that the kingdom of God should be first, but in our lives are not putting that into practice. Not making sure that the priority of our time, our energy, our money is God himself. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You see, what Jesus is asking us to do is not simply reflect on something within our minds. Jesus is not saying, seek him up here. Jesus is saying, I want you to actively, consciously, thoughtfully change your life to make God's kingdom the priority. We cannot seek God 
only on Sunday mornings during this one hour service. Seeking God is a lifelong endeavor. It is an ongoing exercise where we must choose consciously to put him first. Jesus says two things in this verse that I think will help us better understand what it means to make him a priority. The first thing is he says, seek first the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a phrase that comes up a lot in the New Testament. What is it? What does it mean when he's saying, seek first the kingdom of God? Well, Pastor Jeff has often described this one. I think it's a very simple way to describe it. The kingdom of God is simply wherever the rule of reign, rule and reign of Jesus is. Wherever Jesus is recognized as king. That's the kingdom of God. The places in our world, the places in our lives where Jesus is being valued, where his words are being put into action. See, to be a Christian is not to agree to a set of ideas or beliefs. To be a Christian means to surrender to a king. Because Jesus is not primarily a teacher. He is not primarily a coach. He is not primarily someone to help us think more carefully about our lives. He is our king. And the most provocative thing that Jesus does is he asks us to surrender to him. To make his will our will. To make his rule what we value most. Seeking God means that we are finding the elements of our life and saying, what are they pointing towards? Finding those things in our life that should project an image of how good Jesus is, of how valuable Jesus is, and saying, I want to do this better. I want to do this more. I want what Jesus says about my life to be the most important thing. I want to care about what he cares about. I want to talk the way that he talks. I want to live the way that he lives. I want to treat people the way that he treats people, making Jesus' words of first importance to you. That's what it means to seek first the kingdom of God, to submit to the king. If I told you that I really, really loved my wife and that she was the most important thing to me in the whole wide world, but I never spent any time talking to her, I never spent any time listening to her, I never spent any time putting things into my life that would bless her, Would you believe me when I said that she was the most important? Probably not. Probably not. Is Christ more your Lord today than he was yesterday? Or last week? Or last year? The goal is not perfection. It's not that you will live your life in total obedience and flawlessness. Because none of us can do that. I can't do that. But what I can do is make a conscious choice to grow towards that. To say, I want to be better at this. I want to make it important that I'm changing, perhaps the things that I'm watching, the things that I'm listening to, the people that I'm spending time with, so that my life will reflect that God's kingdom is most important and that Jesus' words are most important to me. The second thing that Jesus says is his righteousness, to seek first his righteousness, Another phrase that we can sometimes too quickly run over. What does it mean? Well, the most important thing that we believe as Christians is that our relationship with God is built upon not what we do, but what Jesus has done. It is the absolute fundamental truth of the gospel that we are loved not because we are righteous, but because Jesus is. And what the Bible says about the cross is that What Jesus did for us on that cross, when he forgave us of our sin, when he took our place, is he gave us his righteousness. That's one of the things that the Bible says about that moment. And what it means is, is that he gave us right standing with God. Jesus is the one who gave us right relationship with God. Now what it means to seek that first is to recognize first and foremost that you are justified not by what you do, but by what he has done that your life has meaning and value and significance, not because you have achieved something, but because he has achieved something on that cross, on your behalf. We should seek to make that the anchor of our life, the anchor of, of where we find our value, where we find our importance, in what Jesus has done for us. It's what God has said about our lives. 
And if this is what God has done, if he has been righteous on our behalf, if God is the one who has given himself, who has sought us, how could we not seek after him? So how do we do it? What are the details of what we do here? How do we seek this God? Let's talk about it. How to seek. In Psalm 119, verses nine through 10, the psalmist writes this. He says, how can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word? With my whole heart I seek you, let me not wander from your commandments. The way that we seek God, as we've already said, is to bring his words into the different places of our lives and let Christ become the goal of all that we do. The things that we value in life are not things in and of themselves, but they are pointers towards Jesus and we use them to seek him, to serve him. And what the psalmist says in 119 is he says, I want to guard my life and seek him according to his word. I want to value the words of Jesus. I want to make sure that I don't wander from his commandments. So if we are to look at our lives, look at the details, look at our families, our workplaces, our finances, our own hearts, how are we putting Christ's word into action? How are we making him king? To simplify it a little bit for us this morning and get very practical, I want to talk about four places I believe the Bible calls us to seek God's kingdom. And the first is our family. The first place we are to seek him is in our family. There are a lot of ways that we can do this. There are a lot of ways that you can make Jesus the priority in your family. Let's start with marriage. What I love about marriage is that consistently throughout the Bible, God upholds marriage as something that he deeply, deeply loves and values, that it is a reflection of his relationship with us. And so it comes as no surprise then that Jesus has things to say about the way that we love one another in marriage. We need to put those into action. When Janae and I first got married, it was uh, something that we cared about a lot. We said we wanted to seek God in our marriage and we would make time to pray together, to read God's word together. But as life got busier and kids multiplied, we kind of moved away from it a little bit. And we had to make the conscious choice, no, this is a priority and we need to make time for it. It can't come after everything else. So if that means first thing in the morning we choose to pray together, to take two minutes to check in with each other and say, what's God doing in your life? What have you been praying about? How can I pray for you? That is the beginning of how we can seek God. Sometimes we tell ourselves, well, if we're not doing an hour or two hours or we're not doing a really in-depth Bible study or something very spiritual like that, we say that we're not really seeking God. But I don't want you to be discouraged over some of the little ways that you can be seeking God. Sometimes it is not possible to do a big Bible study together or something of that nature, but it's always possible to ask questions of each other. These days, there's various ways that you can text, you can message, you can get notes to your loved ones and say, hey, I'm praying for you. I'm thinking of you. This is what I feel like God is saying about you. Making sure that the way that I love my spouse is projecting something about what's most important to me in my marriage. With our kids, something that's very important to me is the middle school director. I think about this a lot because the truth is that the, the main disciple is in our kids' lives, in our grandkids' lives, in our nieces' and nephews' lives, is not the church. It's family. It's parents. It's brothers and sisters. It's aunts and uncles. It's grandparents. You are God's primary means of teaching kids about who he is, what he's done. As a middle school director, I work with our students and I see parents who are often discouraged and feeling like they don't have the voice that they want to have in their kids' lives. But I want to encourage you that no matter how it appears, your voice is powerful in the lives of your kids. I did not get along very well with my mom when I was younger, not at all. I would be ashamed to talk about some of the ways that I got along with my mom with you guys this morning, but the words that she spoke about Jesus, they're still there. 
I do what I do in part because of some of the things that she spoke into my life, some of the ways that she projected what was most important in her life. Pray for your kids. Pray with your kids. One of the best pieces of advice that I've gotten from Pastors Brian and Jeff about the way that I parent my own kids is to pray with them, is to spend time every day, every morning or every night talking to them about Jesus so that they see what's most important to mom and dad. And the other thing, and this, this one is huge, repent to your kids. Ask for forgiveness from your kids. Your kids need to see that you need Jesus too. Your family needs to know that you recognize your need for Jesus. If you are vulnerable with them in that way and you are willing to confess and ask for forgiveness, it will project a message about who God is and what's most important to you. Not being right, but being Jesus's. Second place that we can seek God is in our work, in our workplace. It's easy for a lot of us to see the places that we work as just the place where we go to make sure we can get the money to do the real things that we want to do. But God doesn't see our workplaces that way. God doesn't see our professions that way. Regardless of whether it is a quote-unquote Christian profession, God sees the workplace as a mission field as a place where you can seek him, as a place where you can seek to put his kingdom first. Let me ask you, do you know the names and the stories of your coworkers? I've worked a lot of places where I didn't get to know those around me. I didn't know their names of their family members. I didn't know the issues of their life. We don't need to get on a box in the break room and say repent to seek God's kingdom in our workplaces. We don't need to become a preacher. We don't need to become a Bible scholar. We can simply get to know the names of the people around us, get to know their situation so that we can know what are the things that we really need prayer for? What are the things that really matter to them, the places where they need God right now? Go out of your way to love your coworkers, to be different than the rest of the world. Try and make it a priority that when you are in your workplace, it's not simply the tasks of the day, but it's the people that you do them with. Find those people even that you don't like at work, the people that perhaps no one else likes, and love them especially. Live in such a way in your workplace that the people around you ask questions about why do they do that? Why do they treat people like that? Why do they always have that attitude when things are going south, when things are stressful? Why do they keep themselves together? Why are they always serving others? Why are they always the first ones to give support to those who need support? How does your attitude at work reflect who God is? How does it reflect what's most important to you? The third place that we can seek God, and this is a big one, is in our finances. What do your monthly expenditures look like? If we were to take a checkbook analysis, where does most of your money go? The uncomfortable truth is it's very easy to spend our money on the things that we love and we need and then give Jesus the leftovers. But seeking first the kingdom of God means asking some important questions about how we use our money. Now that might And I really want to emphasize emphasize might mean giving to your local church or your church body. It might. But it's very important that we recognize, and I, I say this not only as a member of Chapel Street Church, but also before God this morning, giving to the church does not equal seeking God first in your finances. It's not the same thing. It is a way you can do that. But you can equally support privately, independently, a missionary. You can give to a local organization that's serving the needs of your city. You can give money to your next door neighbor who is in need. You can help them pay for the things that they need to pay for if they are in need. You can even change the way that you tip in a restaurant as a way to seek God in your finances. Because the heart of seeking God in your finances is generosity, something that we've already talked about in this series, is desiring that Jesus would have authority over how you use your money. Valuing, spending money on the things that Jesus values. Loving others, supporting others, encouraging others. We, all of us, no matter what our income bracket, have space 
to give money to the kingdom of God in one way or another, to love others, to be generous, to give away what has been given to us. The last place we must seek God is in our own heart. In our own heart. Because the truth is we can do all these other things and still lose sight of what's most important. We can think about how we use our money. We can think about our relationships in the family. We can think about the way we act in the workplace. But if in our heart, when no one is looking and we are in that secret, quiet place, our heart does not put Jesus first, those other things don't matter. If when I'm away from this pulpit, Jesus is still not the priority, it doesn't matter what I've said behind it. And I mean that. It is important that we as followers of Jesus make our own heart the starting ground for seeking God's kingdom. As we close, I'll try and explain this one by way of my own story. Because when I first became a Christian at the age of around 16, I wanted to make following God a priority. But only when people were looking at me. Only when I was sat at church, only when I was in youth group, only when I was around people that I knew that was important to. When I was alone, the Bible didn't mean the same. My prayer life didn't look the same. But Jesus being the good father that he is, God being the good father that he is, loved me enough and gave me enough grace to put people in my life that says, Andrew, that's not what seeking first the kingdom is. I am not to treat Jesus like I tread that French horn as something that's there to serve my needs. My heart needs to decide consciously that I want Jesus to be the end goal in himself. For me, for my life, whether anyone sees it or not. One of my favorite pastors, David Platt, a wonderful preacher, says that for followers of Jesus, Jesus is not someone who is a part of our lives. Jesus is our lives. He is the one who is the end goal of everything that we do. And the beauty of that and the reason why we seek is because if we do that, we will see him for who he is, the one who satisfies the desires of our heart, the one who clothes the lilies of the field, the one who feeds the beds of the air, the one who has given his son for us. As we seek him, we will see it better. And it's said in the book of Jeremiah, if you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. God wants to be found. He wants us to know him better. So our challenge this week is gonna be taken from Jesus' words earlier in Matthew, earlier in chapter six, when he shares what we've come to know as the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew 6, 9 and 10, he says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our challenge this week is to start each day praying these words, taking stock of our lives and what's most important to us, what our time, our energy, our money is pointing towards, and asking our Father in heaven who loves us, your kingdom come, your will be done in my life and through my life. I will be praying that with you this week. And what excites me most is to know what we will see in our God if we will truly seek him where he may be found. Would you pray with me as we close this morning? Father, we love you so very much. We are so grateful for your kindness, your goodness. We are grateful most of all that when you call us to seek you, you have sought us first. But God, I pray that we would not let our lives of, and pursuit of you become something that happens in our mind only, but that our words and our actions would all reflect what is most important to us. That we would make you the priority, that we would seek first your kingdom and your righteousness so that we might better know you, love you, and share you with those around us. Jesus, you are worthy of it all. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.